Martin Popoff back again for Overkill Reviews. Before we get started on this review, pretty important album here. We do have a Patreon. It'd be really cool if you uh, check us out there and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. This week, I'm reviewing the 17th album from pretty much heavy metal's biggest band of all time. Iron Maiden uh, definitely might be the biggest heavy metal band of all time by some measures. It's certainly one of the most beloved. We're looking at Iron Maiden's 17th album, Senjutsu, out today on EMI Parlophone. So this is where we normally give you a little history of the band, but this is Iron Maiden. You guys all know who Iron Maiden is, so we're just going to go through it pretty quickly. They were kind of the first and the best and the biggest of the new wave of British heavy metal bands. They went through a lot of changes uh, over those years. They had the Blaze uh, Bailey era uh, in the 90s. Um, but, you know, in terms of kind of a modern look at the band, uh, Bruce came back for Brave New World, and there's been pretty regular records ever since. They've actually become one of the biggest touring bands of all time. It just got bigger and bigger and bigger, and that's why I said that earlier that, you know, possibly this is the biggest heavy metal band of all time. Senjutsu is their first album since Book of Souls, so it's the first album in six years. So that's a little recap of Maiden. Again, I didn't want to go into the whole history, but the last 20 years have been this uh, pretty consistent thing where they go out on these massive tours and Bruce has been back for all of it. And, and you know, the albums are pretty similar and they're kind of discussed the same way. And I think you're going to see that a little bit when we talk about Senjutsu as well. All right, so what's good about Senjutsu? There's a number of things that are good about this album. I think it's a pretty cool album. The drumming is good on this. The people who have heard the original first couple of songs that came out, there was first Writing on the Wall and then Stratego. Uh, everybody's talking about Nico's drumming, and I think it's uh, he does a really good job on this record. He's one of these really characteristic drummers that has his own sound, and you definitely hear it across the record a lot. In fact, the opening title track, Senjutsu, uh, is a very different song for them, where he's kind of doing this, tribal tom thing all the time do, 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 like that kind of thing and it kind of goes through the whole song so you don't normally see that out of nico Stratego is a really cool, uh, you know, kick-ass, uh, in-your-face song. It's not one of the longer ones on it. It's got a good maiden gallop, but again, it's a little non-obvious. Kevin Shirley's production, I mean, there's a lot of debate about the mix. There's been, you know, people have de debating, are Bruce's vocals a little muffled? I don't really see any problem with the sound. It's almost like, you know, I've, I've already kind of debated with people on Facebook about this. Yeah, if Kevin didn't do what he does on this, these maiden albums, then you'd complain that it was too perfect. So the kind of the cool thing about what Kevin does on this record is he is he just gets into that intrinsic maidenness of what they're doing. It's recorded at the same place as they did Book of Souls in France and they also recorded it kind of the same way. They did this thing where they kind of wrote the songs and rehearsed them and got them down really fast to keep that freshness going. There are some really interesting, different, non-obvious songs on it. I think The Time Machine is one of the best songs they've done in a long time. There's also a really cool ballad on this album called Darkest Hour. And it's a ballad throughout, but it's a really well put together song. You know, all the parts make sense. There aren't a lot of parts to it. Uh, it's not into this, uh, you know, intro and outro sort of situation. It's just a well put together song that actually stays mellow throughout. So that was actually kind of surprising. The other thing that's really cool about this record is that the guitar solo are really kind of non-obvious and non-maiden-like. There's a lot of bite to them and a lot of rhythm and a lot of tone that Kevin puts on the solos. There's a lot of soloing as well. Usually it's accompanied by kind of a new musical passage. So you really get to see a lot of looks at these guys soloing. And obviously there's three guys doing it. Uh, you know, I haven't kind of gone through and kind of pulled apart and figured out who's doing what because that's a big debate with Maiden as well and people are already talking about that. And people are already confused. They, don't, they really don't, you know, can't tell who's doing uh, the solos across these songs but the solos are really really cool and hopefully uh, when the credits come out you know they're going to do that time-honored thing that Maiden does and split it all out so we can get to see who's doing what. Now moving to what's bad about this album. There's a lot about this that people are going to complain about. What I love about Iron Maiden fans is that they are so obsessed about the band and they will argue about every single detail. And what I've seen is that in a lot of cases, the bigger the fan, the more they'll complain. And there has been a lot of complaining already. And it is about the usual things. When the writing on the wall came out, uh, so this is the first song that was uh, put out as a single. It's a little bit of a different song, but it's a little more classic rock and casual and even a little Southern rocking. So that really caught a lot of people off guard. 
it almost has a bit of a, a lazy written quality to it, which a lot of Maiden songs do actually. That's one of the things that's not great about this album is that um, it does give you a lot of things that fans already complain about, but to Steve's credit, it's, it's interesting that they'll keep doing these things that fans complain about. So another thing that I would say fits in the bad category, and again, a lot of Maiden fans will dispute this, is the long songs. I've always been a complainer about the super long Iron Maiden songs. I don't think they do a good job with it. You know, when people are trying to be uh, complimentary about these long songs, they say, oh, they're proggy, right? Iron Maiden is not proggy. They're very, very rarely proggy. They're just long, long and repetitious with a minute intro and sometimes up to a minute outro, you know, a bunch of parts in between that don't necessarily stitch together all that well. Granted, they do do that prog thing where uh, they will return to themes. Um, they'll also like double time uh, something that was a theme earlier, but there are the long songs on this album. And in fact, uh, you know, Steve is almost like putting it in your face again because this is an 82 minute album. You know, they, they didn't make it short enough that it would fit on one CD. They really only would have had to like pair off about three minutes and it would have been a single CD. But the interesting thing is, the last three tracks are all 10 minutes long, roughly each on average, and they're all written by Steve Harris alone. So you get through all these songs where there's one or two long ones, uh, you know, in between, and then you get these three super long songs, which really kind of test your patience. None of them actually like truly stand out as amazing Maiden classics either. There's a lot of sort of redone themes. Death of the Celts is already getting compared by people who've heard the album, you know, in advance. It's getting uh, compared to The Klansman, of course. I I noticed a spot in a song called Lost in a Lost World, which actually starts out really cool and I'm super interested. Right at the 439 mark, it turns into like, where have I heard this before? It's a little bit afraid to shoot strangers and definitely a lot of X Factor and the Virtual Eleven. And you know, you get into that thing that Maiden does, which just sounds comical to me after all these years where they go, do, 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 you know, and it's it's just this this ridiculous, simple rhythm. Uh, it's, it's a trope, it's a cliche, and Maiden does it way too often. That was the first time on this album, quite deep into the album, where I felt like, you know what, They're they're probably going to turn in a bunch of stuff on here that ain't so great. So that's what I didn't like about, uh, you know, this, this transition point in the early part of the album. Halfway through this Lost in a Lost World, they lost me. So there you go. There's some of the good, some of the bad about the Maiden. Again, it's going to get debated to death. I'll tell you one thing about Maiden in the 2000s. When you look at a people's favorite Maiden albums of the 2000s, there is really no kind of set ranking that you see. I mean, often you see Brave New World. I think Brave New World is kind of overrated, but there's rankings all over the place for these Maiden albums. I wanted to preface that because I'm going to rank Senjutsu kind of in this uh, 2000s oeuvre uh, where I put it. First of all, for a skull rating, I'm going to give this record 3.5 out of 5 skulls. I'm also a little bit of a contrarian when it comes to these later Iron Maiden albums because my favorite Iron Maiden albums of this entire run are perhaps a little bit a matter of life and death, but I really love The Final Frontier and I love The Book of Souls. And those are two that a lot of fans complain about. So if I were to put Senjutsu in this 2000 ranking somewhere, I would probably put it fourth after those three records. So it'd be really interesting to see what you all think of the Iron Maiden album, Senjutsu. Let us know in the comments below. And again, we do have Patreon as well. And please subscribe to the channel. This is Martin Popoff signing off for Overkill Reviews.